Welcome everyone. Namaste. Good morning. Salam. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are from every corner of the world, a very hearty welcome. So today in, in the International Center for Women's Leadership, Code Institute, we'll be speaking to a very special guest, Shireen Esof. And this is a part of learning about feminism, you know, the F word. And I don't know what you're thinking when I talk about the F word. I'm certainly talking about feminism. So hearty welcome to all of you. Today marks the 10th anniversary of the International Center for Women's Leadership. Incidentally, it also marks the memorial of Moses Cody, who uh, this is the 62nd memorial of Moses Cody, and, and, and we remember him very fondly, very lovingly today. Uh, so uh, I quickly want to tell you that today we'll be talking to a feminist activist, a scholar, a mobilizer, all in one, who reads sometimes like a book itself, and one of my favorites, Shireen Esof. So a hearty welcome to you, Shireen. We will be holding a very interactive session. So there is no time and you can start shooting your questions now, as in now. But before we do that, and before I start my first question to Shireen, let me quickly tell you about her. So Shireen is a Zimbabwean feminist activist. She's an educator and organizer. She's been a part of the women's movement and many other social movements towards justice, equity, and equality. Shireen deconstructs the very intersectional oppressive systems brick by brick, and I have seen her do it with all its complexity, which is what I really like about her. So she's not just an academician who deconstructs it. She's right in the middle of all these major fighting back the major oppressive structures. She's very committed to amplifying women's voices, their visibility, their organization, and their power. And, you know, a lot of what the work that she does puts decolonization in the center, I think, which is something that we really need to talk about. So intersectionality and decolonization are things that we will begin with very strongly today, I think. But let me also take you a little further on Shireen's intro, which is not it. She, apart from uh, mobilizing, you know, she has published extensively and uh, she's published a, a lot around Zimbabwean feminist movement, My Dream to be Bold, The Work to End Patriarchy. And these are just, just the tip of the iceberg. She has many other publications apart from this. Shireen currently is the executive director of Just Associates, JAS, as we all know it. And JAS is a global feminist support organization that equips and strengthens the leadership and organizational capacity of women leaders across Mesoamerica, Southeast Asia, and Southern Africa. I take great pride, honor, and love in welcoming you, Shireen, to this uh, special conversation, a very interactive one. Uh, uh, a very learning and unlearning one today with, with people who are here. And, and just to quickly tell you, many of the people who are here are graduates, are very young women and men who are looking forward to understanding and deconstructing the notion of feminist leadership itself, you know, as opposed to a lot of art leadership designs that exist. And, uh, you know, Shula Smith Firestone says that feminism when it truly achieves its goals, will crack through the most basic structures of the society. And that is where I plan to begin asking the first question. How has your journey been? So how has your personal journey been? And how do you sort of locate it in the context of a larger battle of feminism amidst, amidst the second wave and you know the so critiqued caricature of second wave, which was the third wave? So how, how do you look at it? Would, would you like to tell us a little about that? Sure. I mean, firstly, Sirika and the Cody community, um, I'd like to just thank you um, for inviting me to be in conversation with you. 
um, as part of your work and you know the 10 years that you are that you are celebrating so I really step into this conversation in a way where I am also going to be listening and learning as well as sharing and engaging um, and I take that um, invitation as a privilege and an honor so so thank you for having me um, I think maybe to just dive in um, in terms of the question that you have asked. I mean, there's many directions that I can move in, but I think because my feminism puts at the center the meaning of the personal is political, I think I will start with the personal. Um, you know, when I was much younger um, and my, my maternal grandmother was, was, was still alive, um, I was very, very close to her and I would spend um, hours um, sitting on her veranda, which is where it is that she would conduct her business of the day. Um, and I remember her telling me a story. Um, she was a, a, a leader. She wouldn't necessarily use the word feminism, but I think she was a feminist leader and, and community mobilizer in her own way, um, as well as a, a, a very proficient businesswoman. Um, but she only had formal schooling up until the age of about 10 or 11, after which she, you know, was then, you know, kept at home and ultimately married at a very young age. And I have a very vivid memory of, of my grandmother telling me, you know, when she married my grandfather, um, if my grandfather said that this was white and she knew that it was black she would say, yes, it's white. And I think in my, in my younger, you know, 10 year old self, I didn't fully understand what it is that she was saying, given that I didn't have the analytical tools to deconstruct that. But I, I think that as I, as I progressed in my own, you know, journey as a, as a student, and then ultimately, you know, working for um, feminist organizations, as well as being in the academy, I obviously, you know, developed the language to be able to name what it is that I heard and at the heart of what it is that my grandmother was telling me was a story about power and was a story about gender and was a story about socialization um, into what Audre Lord calls the master's house where if you don't abide by the rules of the master's house that essentially right tells us about what it means and how to be a man or a woman in very very fixed categories right you will be met with violence and you will be met with discipline because the master's house is intent on replicating the systems of oppression through institutions. And I think my feminism is really embedded at that intersection. My feminism, and so I wanna push back a little bit against the waves that you've used, right, Sarika? Um, because yes, the waves academically, right, map how it is that feminism may have traveled in certain parts of the world, but we know that there have been strong pushback right, from those of us in the majority world against first and even second wave feminism for its blindness in recognizing the struggles of women in the majority world as feminist in and of themselves. They may use different metrics, right, in terms of how it is that you read resistance because that's so context specific. But I think there's a thick conversation there um, I don't necessarily want to get into it because it's an academic conversation. And I think academic conversations are important and have their place. But if I'm sitting under a tree with women in Malawi, the conversation of which wave of feminism I fit into has no meaning. And so I think in that, what I'm saying is unless we can see and recognize feminist resistance against structural oppression, however it is that it manifests given context specificity, we've missed the boat, right? And in that, I'm talking about the, the interplay 
between the theory and the praxis. Yes. So that's a little aside. I mean, to, to come back to the story of, of how it is that I understand feminism, you know, I think at the heart of my understanding of, of feminism sits um, a deep understanding that a feminism that doesn't feed emancipatory struggles led by those who are most impacted by systems of oppression. And by that, I mean patriarchy, right, as the, as the, as the doorway through which we enter. But we know that patriarchy works together with other systems, right? The, the cousins or, or the brotherisms, capitalism, neoliberalism, racism, extractivism, religious fundamentalism, nationalism, you know, all of those isms come together like cogs in a wheel and they, and they reinforce and reproduce each other. And so for me, a feminism that doesn't deal with dismantling systemic oppression potentially, and this is a controversial statement to make, potentially becomes part of the problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than the solution. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that means that at the heart of my feminism that draws on, you know, um, that draws on how it is that liberatory, right, liberatory articulations of a feminism um, that include, you know, Black feminist thought, that include Pan-Africanism, that include, you know, that body of work, at the heart of that sits a deep analysis of how power plays out. Mm -hmm. And so if I have to loop back to the story of my grandmother, right, that's the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm not there because I've said a lot. <laughs> Well, would any of any of you have any questions around what you, we are talking about? It's a very open forum, so feel free to type in your questions. You know, uh, you you just kickstarted it so well, but I I sort of wanted to go back uh, around the time when you were growing up, and mm -hmm. a lot of it is is your personal experiences. The personal is political, but the political is also personal, right? So. As in when you were growing up, and, and again, there was a larger milieu of feminism as to what was considered a very white, mainstream, elitist, bourgeois feminism. How did you begin to decipher your own feminism against that backdrop? Okay, so um, I think, and, and I guess this is where intersectionality starts to become important, right? Because I think we all show up in the world, not just in the bodies of women or gendered as women, for me anyway. I show up in the world, yes, as a woman, but I also show up in the world raced and classed in a very, very particular way. And I get rid in that way, right? Yes. And so I think part of the gift of my journey is that I've always been surrounded by very strong women who mm -hmm. manifested in different ways, almost as signposts along my journey. So I started with my grandmother. I think my mother is another example. You know, although she may not see herself as being strong in the same way, I think women navigate systems in a way that you don't necessarily see yourself as strong. But sometimes the fact that you are getting up every day and you are making sure that the children are taken care of, making sure that there's food on the table, making sure that there's a roof over their heads is an articulation of strength, actually, against a system that may be actively working to deny those things, right? If you, are, if you show up in the world as a woman, as Black, as living in the majority world, as poor or working class. So I think I've always had women who have been who have been signposts along the way. And I think it is really those women who at different moments in my life have contributed to a conversation that I was having with myself and to my own journey in allowing me to go deeper and to travel paths that I think I needed to travel in order to really further hone right, my own political analysis of my 
personal experience, mm -hmm. but then also by extension, how it is that one travels with that in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, th there's a saying that says, when you're ready, right, the, the, the knowledge will come or when you when you most need the guidance, the guidance will come. And in, in some, and I don't want to be esoteric about it, but I mean, you know, the feminist goddesses take care of us, right? <laughs> um, and so there have been women, you know, who have given me the language to be able to articulate my experience. And, you know, just to answer your question more fully, Sarika, those women have largely been, you know, located in contexts where they too are thinking and working with intersectional frames of race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, um, to be able to give me the eyes, right? The, the analytical frames to see better how it is that the political is personal and the personal is always political. Right, right. Wow. You know, I, I remember this forum, which was a, a very senior feminist forum in India. And I remember walking in about 10 years ago when I wasn't so old. And there was this very senior- Not that you're old now, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember most of the discussions and the decisions, you know, being taken up and uh, declared by these very, very senior activists. And at the end of it, I remember that the only thing that I could establish was to have an intergenerational dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm telling you this is, you know, while uh, I, I remember you saying something very beautiful in our last conversation, which, which was not just being aware of our discrimination, but also being aware of our privileges. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for quite some time, uh, given that even if I were to talk it, about it in an academic sense, the feminist movement, which is not a homogeneous movement, by the way, you know, did make the same mistakes if I under quotes that others did. So, you know, it, 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 it was very clearly elitist. It was with the powerful women. It said that, and the kind of rights that we were talking about were not about structural transformation, right? Mm -hmm. They were stopgap arrangements. So, you know, allow us right to vote and a little bit of property. And, you know, we, we know that we are inferior. We are not really there. We know we accept it. We have normalized it. Now, if I were to look at a feminist movement now, which is evolved, and, and the reason why I very clearly declare that I'm a feminist, and I know that I hear that a lot of late, I'm a feminist, but, you know, but is, is the fact that, you know, we've evolved and critiqued ourselves quite a bit. So we've never come and said that, you know, we are a movement, which is, we, we have just arrived, you know, we are the people who have arrived. And I know that the Dalit movement, which for everyone else is the anti-caste movement in India, doesn't acknowledge women so much as the feminist movement acknowledges Dalit women. But so we've evolved a bit. But if I were to go to the question that I'm trying to ask you through a series of personal experiences, is that what challenges do you see now? You know, and again, they will not be very homogeneous. So they, yours will be very different from, you know, probably mine. What challenges do you see now in terms of feminist movement? And what are the kind of feminist leaders that we have established that we can show everyone? You know, that you, you look at her and then can you be a leader like her or him? Okay, so that's a really complex question. <laughs> um, okay, where do I start? Um, I think I'm gonna start with feminism. And you're completely right. I, I think there are a multiplicity of feminisms. And I think that that is, that is important and it's right because the work to dismantle, you know, patriarchy and allied systems is big work, right? It's big work and it's long-term work. Um, and so there are, there's, a broad, there's a broad field, right? Where work is needing to be done. And I think the second thing that I would say by way of stepping into an answer to your question, Sarika, is that there's a lot of work that has been done, right? The last, you know, the last century, right? We are sitting here today, all of us, in the way that we are. Yes. 
because of the work that has been done, yes. right, by those who have come before us. Yes. Um, and it's long work and it's hard work and it's manifested in different spaces in different ways, right? Both within, right, mm -hmm. the master's house, yes. as well as outside of the master's house in the creation of autonomous spaces for feminist work in its plurality. So feminism in its plurality, right? So I think that's the second thing that, that is important to say by way of framing the, my answer to your question. I think that the third thing is that there are huge debates, right? And I, I think that it's, it's, it's Rosa Luxemburg who puts on the table the question of reform or revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to think about it in, in a number of ways. Power is a very complex thing right now. And feminists, in the way that I understand feminism, as I said earlier, have at the heart of the analysis, a reading of power. Yes. I think that jazz, we like to, we, we use something called a power framework, which supports us in having these conversations and creating learning spaces that allow community-based women, right? To develop the tools, to be able to analyze power, but also, you know, think about strategy then. So for us, power manifests in three phases, three faces of very negative forms of power. Mm -hmm. The power over, right? So there's visible power, which is about the power of formerly elected officials, as in people in the states, et cetera, et cetera. Power manifests in a second phase, which we like to name as hidden or shadow power. Yes. Right? So essentially what it means is there are people who have interests and who will engage the state as legitimate or illegitimate actors in order to ensure that the state creates the conditions for those actors to operate. So let me give you a concrete example. If we think about, and I think the most visible and blatant example of this is actually what happened in the last number of years with the Trump administration, yeah. right? So you had right, right-wing white supremacist interests, right, sitting in formal power, sitting in the structures of the state, right, but you also had people who were lobbying, religious yes. fundamentalists, right, you had people who were lo lobbying those in formal positions of power to ensure, right, that the policy conditions allowed for them to operate, that is hidden or shadow power. And then there's invisible power. And invisible power we like to, to think about as the norms and the attitudes and the beliefs, right? So it's almost like 4G or 5G if you have to think about Wi-Fi. It's yeah. there all the time, but you just can't see it, right? And those things interlock. They work together, right? In terms of how it is that power, how it is that power operates in the world. Now, why am I telling you this whole long story? because that's a complex equation. Mm -hmm. And it is not enough for us to just work at the level of policy. No, very true. Right? And that is often where, you know, second wave feminists locate themselves, right? A liberal feminism that is about reform, right? So if we have half a loaf of bread, that's enough. Mm -hmm. At least we've got half a loaf, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that reform and revolution, as Rosa Luxemburg articulated, is not a dichotomy. It's not this or this right now, yes. because I think the complexities of how it is that power is working means that as feminists, we've got to have insider strategies and we've got to have outsider strategies. And I think the most visible concrete example of this is actually, you know, the erosions that have happened in, in multilateral spaces like the UN that have also been occupied. Right. I mean, you take abortion rights, right? The religious right, right, has lobbied states, right, to push back again, right. granting the rights to, to free and safe and legal abortions. What is that about? But it means that as feminists, we've got to be very, very clear about what our ultimate goal is. And we've got to work both inside and outside. Because I think right now we are in a situation where we are both needing to block and, and hold onto the gains that are rapidly eroding, actually, 
because of rising authoritarianism and the way it is, you know, that our world, you know, um, extractivist capitalism at its at its height, right? We are needing to shore up against the gain, so block, but also find ways of building, right? I think for me, I mean, just to be very explicit about it, um, my work is not within, is not is not within, you know within the structures. I think stru those kinds of structures like the state, like the church are not homogenous. So there's always possibility, right? There's always possibility. And one always has to be asking, where is the light? Or where are the cracks where the light shines through, right? In this master's house and they, and, and they exist, those cracks exist. Um, but for me, I think, and for, for a jazz, we very, very firmly locate ourselves with communities and women in struggle who are challenging power, who are building the consciousness and the leadership to be able to further support and strengthen the movements that they are located in and who are constantly thinking about safety because it's a dangerous and violent world out there, right? And that's one of the byproducts, right? Of oppressive systems. Yes. Oppressive systems need to ensure certain levels of control and policing, and that generates violence. And so the minute women feminist activist leaders tap power on the shoulder in some shape or form, you have to be prepared as a leader that something is gonna come at you because power is not just given over, it has to be taken, yes. right? And so there's a dynamic there, you know? And so how it is that you think about collective protection and safety to mitigate risk and threat and violence is right now baked into the meaning of how it is that you do movement work and how it is that you lead. So I wanna end by really honing in on the, on the question about leadership, because that was the question that, that was embedded in what it is that you were, that you were saying and asking. You know, I approach leadership really from a movement perspective. So what do movements tell us about how as feminists we do leadership? Mm -hmm. And movements tell us a number of things. Movements tell us that when one is thinking about feminist leadership, one has to think about how you hold and exercise and distribute power. Yes. Right? So we cannot, in the practice, replicate the very same praxis of power that we are trying to dismantle. Yes. And that means that we've got to do self-work, right, in terms of how it is that we understand ourselves in relation to the world, in relation to a leadership position and power. But it also means, and this is the second point, or the second lesson that I think movements give us about feminist leadership, is that distributed leadership means that you've got multiple leaders. We each may be playing different roles, and that's important in terms of organizing and organization. You can't have everybody doing the same thing, yes. right? I mean, it's just not, it's just not gonna work, right? Yes. So you have different people playing different roles, but each of those roles are absolutely key to the contribution right, of the whole and the work of the whole. Yes. And so how as a leader, you hold people in that understanding that then means you've got multiple leaders is critically important. And for me, this leaps back to the question about violence because we know, right, and we have seen this specifically in struggles around the defense of land and territories mm -hmm. where women are being murdered. Women are being arrested. Women are, are subjected to, you know, sexual violence. You take out a leader. I mean, it's the Berta Caceres story, right? But there are a million Berta Caceres throughout the world, right? You murder a leader, but there are hundreds of other women, right? Who are leading the struggle and ensuring the regeneration, right? And so I think that is critically important 
um, and, and a critical lesson from feminist, feminist movements. And so that speaks to how it is that we live into leadership, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how it is that we understand our roles and how it is that we understand what it means to build collectives and to strengthen you know, leaders. And I wanna hone in on the point that you raised about the intergenerational question. You know, um, I often say in jazz and in other spaces that I move through, that the development industry has done us a disservice in some way, because the development industry has forced us into a box that says, and it's the dichotomy again, right? And I think one of the things that patriarchy does is force us into, it's either this or this, you're either rural or you're urban, you're either old or you're young, you're either a man or you're a woman. And yet, actually, there's a continuum there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, because, because we can recognize ourselves in the other, even as much as we hold, right, the power and privilege that comes with different positioning, identity positionings. But I think the point that I'm trying to make is that youth is not an issue. Mm -hmm. Youth is a category. Absolutely. Absolutely. The issues, and it's that intersectional, it's the intersectional analysis, right? The issues manifest differently depending on the kind of body that you are in. Yeah. So if I'm a young black lesbian, how I experience the world, right, is going to be slightly different to if I am an older chronologically, right, black um, heterosexual woman. But in setting that up, I don't want to set it up as a dichotomy because the struggle, right, of this young black lesbian woman is actually my struggle. It's your struggle. And so how we set this up in a way that also allows, right, for that intersectional experience of oppression to be visible and valid yes. in the spaces that we create for movement work is I think for me, another aspect of how it is that one does leadership. The other day we had a jazz wide call and I know that there are some jazz people listening into this conversation. We had a jazz wide call. We, we have these calls every two months that connect the entire organization across our global geographic spread. Wow. And it's always a little bit daunting because as I say, we, we, we almost 50 people in the organization, right? And so you've got people from all over the world connecting. And the other day we had a jazz wide call and I was looking at the Zoom little boxes. And in that, I realized that we are spanning generations from people who are in their late 60s, early 70s mm -hmm. to people who are in their early 20s. Mm -hmm. And not once in jazz do you find the language of, inter of, of young and old, or we need to create space for intergenerational dialogues heard, actually. Because I think there is a political base from which we work that means we are all feminist activists and we are all political agents in the world, yes. no matter how it is that we are positioned in terms of our, our intersectional identities. Yes. So I've said a lot, I hope I've answered your question and I hope that your audience is, is still with me. <laughs> But I'll stop there for now and have some water, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, you, you totally bold me every time. I'm completely bold. But, you know, I, I, my mind goes back to, you know, what Foucault says about power, where, wherever there is power, there is resistance. So he looks at the positive aspect of power. And, you know, you've been looking at it in a very decolonial, intersectional feminist style, right? So you've actually taken that uh, much more forward, right? From what, what he describes it. I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, Shireen, because we've got people here who uh, would want to know about some of these movements. I mean, one example that you put across was just describing the, the you know, small windows of Zoom and how, it, how nobody looks at intergenerational thing. That's also because there is huge power balance. You know, and these courses are not led by, you know, people of a certain age or of a certain race or of a certain ethnicity, right? 
And I think that is what you, what I will carry from here. And I think a lot of us will carry when it comes to the values of feminism. You know, how do you bring in that, that justice, that egalitarianism? When mm -hmm. I don't feel threatened by being younger or, you know, the threat of asking you a wrong question perhaps and getting reprimanded, right? Uh, but, you know, Eileen has a question which I must ask, you know, instead of kind of usurping the stage myself. So I also want to go back to the development uh, uh, agencies. And I think that was a point very well made, you know, the developmentization so-called of, of the entire movement itself and the depoliticization of the movements, right? So Eileen says, how do we make the most of donor-driven development projects focused on women's empowerment? That's the first one. What are some of the things we need to be mindful of to ensure that they are truly feminist in approach, knowing that it's often easier, easier under quotes, to focus typically on empowerment due to concerns about context, safety, and security? Okay, so that's a multi-level question. <laughs> um, you know, I I come from Southern Africa, and, and that is where my my work um, and political work um, has really been rooted up until maybe three, three or four years ago. And so I bring a very deep history and engagement with the meaning of development aid and what it is and how it played out in that particular region of the world. Um, I, I think that there's a number of things. That, that that I would want to raise in in partly maybe Eileen answering your question. Um, I think the first one is what is development? So we know and, and who's deciding about what constitutes development. So you know um, late last week I was involved in um, teaching a session at Cadestria, which is the Council for Social Science Research um, and, and, and Development in Africa. And, you know, with, with the, the 40 participants who were part of the Gender Institute at Cadestria, we were really thinking about a, a, a movement that comes out of South Africa called the Amadiba Crisis Committee. And the Amadiba Crisis Committee is currently fighting back against the state, as well as an Australian mining company who are wanting to mine um, titanium in the ancestral, on the ancestral lands. And so they are basically defending a 22 kilometer stretch of land. Um, and I, I think it's against that example that I can begin to unpack some of these questions around development. And so the state visible power with influence by hidden interests are saying, you know, we need to develop, we need to put in a road and, you know, the mine will ensure that you then have access to good transport lines to service, you know, whatever it is that you may be needing to do in that particular province. And with that will come schools and with that will come hospitals. And that is one way of understanding development. And the community is saying, no, that's not how we understand development. Because for us, if we say yes to all of this stuff, the mind is gonna decimate our ancestral lands. It's gonna decimate our way of life. It's gonna decimate, right? How it is, you know, our indigenous knowledge systems around food, around how it is that we relate to each other, you know, around all of those things. It's gonna scramble. And I think that's at the heart of this development debate, right? Whose development, on whose terms? And in that lies a power differential again, right? So you have the North in many instances deciding what constitutes development, what it needs to look like, backed with the financial resources to ensure, right, that that happens. But the interests are nine times out of 10, right? Not about what this will mean for the community because of how development is done, right? And so the power differential then means that, you know, it's top down, right? It's top down, it's from the North to the majority world. 
um, and, and nobody else has a say. And it comes with its frameworks and it comes with its theoretical frames and it comes with its systems and structures. And yes, we want the money, but then you've got all of this other stuff, right? That basically kills it. And I mean, in the region, the short form of it is NGOization. So the professionalization of struggle and the structuring of civil society in a way that means you've got a proliferation of NGOs, right? As opposed to investments in movements, community-based, right? Power building and agenda setting becomes the axis, right? Against which the conversation happens. So, so what does that mean then, right? Because it is complex, it is tied to resources. I mean, you know, one of the things that we, that we often think about a lot in, in, in jazz and in, and in doing this work is, and, and this is a cheeky thing to do, but it's about how it is that you challenge power in a different way, right? Um, you know, do a reading. Is it possible to negotiate this differently? And if it isn't, then how do you take the frame and set up the systems to be able to manage it, but allow for the agenda to actually feed a movement agenda? So there's a level of translation then that happen. Right, and almost like a buffer mm -hmm. between the agency that is committing the money right, for empowerment work, but then that gets translated onto the ground right, in terms of a more radical movement perspective. And that's very possible. I've seen organizations, including us, do it loads of times. So I think that that, that is very, very possible to do. Um, but I think then, you know, for, for me, you know, the other part of what I'm hearing you ask, Eileen, is um, there's something about alliance building in this conversation and in how it is that we think about this work. That is another principle from movement building that I think we have to take seriously. And for me, the alliance building also speaks to, you know, the fact that the spaces are not homogenous. I think as feminist leaders or as people in the world who are thinking about these things, how it is that we build alliances around shared political visions to be able to leverage work from different sites that we inhabit is critical, right? Because at the end of the day, building a counter power, mm -hmm. right? Against the negative exercise of power, is really what is at the heart of what it is that we are talking about. That's the contestation, right? And, and you know, building a counter power starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with an innate understanding that I matter in a world and in a system that every day is trying to dehumanize us. I matter. And then from there, it moves to a place that says, actually, I can recognize myself and my struggle in your struggle. We may look different and we may sound different, but actually the systems under which we live are the same. And so the fact that I don't have a house and you don't have water is not my problem as an individual or your problem as an individual. It's, it's a systemic problem. And I think once one, as in a movement process, once you understand that, right, there's a recognition that if we work together, and that's power too, if we work together, right, we can do something. And I think it's at that nexus that part of the answer to your question, Eileen, sits, because if we can work together and do something together in solidarity, building, reweaving the social fabric in a way that says, we are centering trust, we are centering care, we are centering joy, we are centering laughter, we are centering what it means to be friends and to show up for each other. The intangibles of movement building, as I like to call them. It means that we can develop a shared political vision for what it is that we are building power for, right? And once you have an articulation of that vision and once you have the base, right? It means that you can, you can that block and build that I was talking about, you are more able to navigate the power of the development industry or the state, right? In a way that allows you to root in what it is that you are wanting. And I think the most explicit example of that, I'm gonna go back to the Trump administration, unfortunately, the most explicit example of that was last year in the US, 
Th that's what I'm talking about. You had years and years of from street to street, community to community, movement for Black Lives organizing. And it translated and landed in a very, very particular political moment, opportunity and time that was able to galvanize, right? And that counterpower blocked. How, it, how we build is a different story, right? But it blocked something. Right. And I think that that's ultimately, right, what we're talking about when we talk about transformation. When we talk about fundamentally different ways of living into how it is that we understand the world. And so, you know, there's that saying that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, you know, we want to chair at the table, right? So often you hear, you know, in, in, in sort of policy spaces or in feminist, feminist theorizing around, you know, um, policy work, um, it's important to have a chair at the table. And then there are a group of more radical feminists whose analysis is saying, actually, we don't want a chair at the table, we want a completely different, we want a completely different arrangement, right? We may not need a table, we may want to sit on the floor, right? Or we may want to stand. We need a completely fundamentally different system at work. And I think there are many people right now who are imagining what that could look like. Mm -hmm. Catalyzed even further by the pandemic, I think this work has always been happening. Um, you know, in the jazz, it shows up in some of the thinking that we've been doing more recently around a feminist just transition that moves from an extractivist, you know, way of ordering life and the world to something that is much more um, centered in care and, and ecosystem re reciprocity, where it's not just about people, but it's also about the cosmos, right? The cosmology, how it is that we re relate to the world and how it is that we live into that. And that requires some, it, it requires imagination. It requires the ability to dream. And I, I see, I, I, I'm not following the chat, but I've seen in the chat, there are a couple of people who are from Zimbabwe on this call. And so, you know, I wanna use a Zimbabwean example since I'm, I'm from Zimbabwe. You know, you know, one of the things that, that started emerging in some of the more radical analysis during, you know, the, 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 the Mugabe era is that one of the things that the political party from which you know, the, the president was from, did very, very successfully, was kill people's ability to dream. Mm -hmm. Now, not only is that violent, but if you kill people's ability to dream, you are actually essentially condemning them to death, maybe not literally but figuratively, yes, right? Because social movement theory and movement work tells us that the ability to imagine and dream something different is the starting point mm -hmm. to begin to live into it. And we see examples around the world. I mean, around the, I mean, the example that I used of Amadiba is, is one such example. It's an autonomous zone that the community is protecting, right? Where they, and I don't want to romanticize it, but where their, their way of knowing, right, is a lot, the Zapatistas is another example. Yes. Right? yes. You know, um, Aura Amba in Ethiopia is another example. Northern Syria, right, the Ryova movement is another example. So there are examples of these social experiments in the face of states breaking their social contracts with, you know, people living in the countries that they are governing, that is really, I think, demanding us to think differently, not just about how it is that we organize ourselves in our communities and societies, but how it is that we practice leadership. And I think feminism has answers, actually. Mm -hmm. I think feminism provides us with answers because feminism, in terms of the analytic, right, the feminism that I am putting into the space, is, is inviting us to structurally, right? Structurally alter how it is that we, how it is that we work, think how it is that we coexist.
-hmm. And that's the first step to imagining something different. Wow. You know, um, I, I, I want to go back again to the NGOization of, of the movement itself. And I know there are other questions. A lot of people are, are thanking you, Shireen. <laughs> And, 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 you know, just like me, you know, equally enriched as so everybody is feeling very enriched here. But, you know, I, I kind of feel from my own experiences and a lot of what you say reverberates in what I also think and say. And uh, which tempts me to sort of, again, usurp this space, sorry, anti-feminist style, but a little bit. I think everybody's going to kind of want to ask this question as well. Is you know, you had this structural adjustment program that happened with our states. And then you had a different structural adjustment program that happened with our movements. And movements got NGOized and depoliticized. And a lot of it was, uh, you know, dependent upon the resources. So I know that movements across the globe, once they were funded, couldn't go back to working in a non-funded style, right? Then they needed their staff and they needed everybody to have their salaries. Now, of late, uh, Shireen, something that I really wonder about, till about, say, seven years back, I would really think very strongly about these extractive capitalist structures, which are marauding earth. And now what I think very strongly about are three things, which are cultural exclusivity, you know, very, very strongly being put in all our heads. It's like we are in doc being indoctrined into it. I think about a very different form of irredent nationalism, which is prevalent right now, you know, sort of what, what happened with, with Jews and the Holocaust, right? And it's, it's somewhere it's opposing the refugees and somewhere it's being totally a majoritarianism like our country. And the third thing I think about is democracy. You know, who are these demos? Are they very, very rich people with strong agendas, the hidden power that you were talking about, the corporations that actually run the governments? And we know that it's no more welfare state, wherever it exists even. So I, I, I want to kind of go back to this whole thing that you were talking about, the answers line feminism, and hear from you. How are you brooding over these? And how, 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 how do you think that uh, women currently think about these? So, you know, I mean, for, for me, part of the answer to your question, um, Sarika, you know, really, really, so let me start in a different place. There's a constant dance that I think we do, or, or certainly I and, and certainly people in jazz do between praxis and theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and for us, Again, there isn't a divide. Theory informs praxis, praxis informs theory. Theory is not something that is done in the university. Right, absolutely. Movements do theory, deep theory, even in as much as movements are engaged in the praxis. And in fact, I would argue, because of the way that neoliberalism has decimated university sites, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right now, universities, in terms of critical spaces for thinking and learning, are, are a little sterile, actually. Mm -hmm. And so you are finding that there are spaces outside of the academy, like movement spaces, who are pushing both the theory and the praxis of how to step into this moment, given where it is that we are, differently. Yes. Yes. And from my experience, a lot of that work is being done by feminist activists. So that's the first point that I want to make. Mm -hmm. I want to link it to an, to a, an, an analysis. And, and this is where I think what I'm saying about feminism providing answers starts to, to become alive, right? You know, feminists know because as, as, you know, women and non-binary, women and queer people, we know that the crisis of COVID is not just about COVID. We have always been living in crisis, right? 
people who are most impacted by systems of oppression are always living in a state of crisis. COVID has just exposed the brokenness of our systems to more people. Yes, very true. Right? Femin women know that the, cri the interconnected crises in terms of public health, in terms of capitalism that positions women as precarious workers, in terms of liberal democracy that allows for a certain kind of authoritarianism, power and control, the climate mm -hmm. crisis, right? And, you know, the complete collapse or, or, or the complete, um, uh, what's the word? The, the, the complete um, re reordering of our natural system are things that women, indigenous women, are things that community-based women, are things that more radical feminists mm -hmm. have always understood. And they've always understood because they live it. The body is the first territory, right? The body is the first site of struggle against which these systems get written. They know it because they live it. And the violence that comes with that is also something that is not unusual. Yes also know, feminists also know, that emotion, anxiety, grief, and uncertainty, right, are the things that are the cauldron for rage and for change, right? We know, as wow. feminists, that those are the things that sit in our gut, that pain, that grief, at injustice, and how it is that we experience it in our lives, that potentially propel us into action. And we also know because we see it, that that action is, is multi-generational, it's multiracial, it's transnational. But we also know, which is why I started with the story of my grandmother, that we draw on our stories and our histories because that is where knowledge lies. Mm -hmm. Knowledge just not just of how to move in the world, but knowledge about how to be in the world differently. Right, so indigeneity, mm -hmm. how do we recoup transformative indigenous knowledge systems to inform how it is that we think about the values and how it is that we operate in the world? And feminism tells us this, right? When we talk about second and third wave fem feminism, that was the debate. Yes. You cannot write us out. You cannot write our stories and histories out as women in the majority world. Right? Our struggle is intersectional and our histories are deep. And only we can unearth those. It cannot be invisibilized. And it's those stories and histories that I think allow us to rethink the new and they allow us to reimagine the we. Right? And I think feminine at the heart of that, that sits on feminist praxis. Yes. Right. So so when I say what I said, that is really what I what I'm part of what it is that I am trying to get at right feminism also gives us a deep reading of power right and I think that um you know we know that the extractivist system and the consolidation of economic political power means that violence, militarization, surveillance is, is the norm in many of our countries. And that the criminalization of protest and dissent yes. is a control. So we are on a terrain, we are on a battlefield. It's like a war. I'm sorry to use militarist, militarized language, but it is, it's like a war. We are on, we are in a war of ideas right now. And on the so there's a clash, there's a clash of worldviews. There's the kind of billionaire bonanza that is, you know, very, very firmly located in, you know, this extractivist, you know, system. And then there's this collective care for bodies, for the planet, for, you know, interdependence, and for what it means, you know, to be in, in relation a little bit differently. Yeah. And I think feminists, you know, are providing already, you know, pathways to do this. And, you know, some of the groups that I mentioned earlier are groups that you can look at, 
you know, that are already modeling and experimenting with systems that allow for, you know, how we think about emergent power that sort of, you know, um, dismantles division, dismantles authoritarianism, dismantles repression and the violence that comes with it, and thinks about, you know, more decentralization, that thinks about the unlikely allies that can come together to create, um, you know, new, new ways of collective power and thinking about community and land and safety. So I'm not going to drone on. Um, but I think for me, those are some of the things that one has to consider, Sarika, when, when you think about this. And certainly we are, 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 you know, considering some of these things in jazz as we think about what we like to call the ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's an ecosystem um, that is unique in its parts, but in its collectivity, mm -hmm. right, is contributing to, you know, a, a, a different kind of world, the crafting of a different kind of worldview um, and a way of being that allows for the health, and this is important, the health of the individual, but also the health of the whole. Mm -hmm. And I say it's important because we're living through a time where sickness and death and grief is very real and very present in all of our lives at a scale that we haven't experienced, right? Maybe since the last pandemic that the world faced. I mean, this is beyond even wars, right? The, the world wars right now. And I think for me, this pandemic is really putting at the center both the interconnectedness of the human species and, and ecology right, and the health of our planet. But it's also putting right at the center the fact that, you know, our world, our world is inflamed, it's burning in different ways. It's burning in people's bodies if they're unwell. It's burning through fires at scale that we are seeing in different parts of the world. It's burning, you know, through heat, literally. Um, you know, it's burning because the economic systems are churning in ways that are causing them to overheat um, and, and combust in some way. And, and, I, and I think that what in indigenous knowledge systems, again, not to romanticize it, but I think that, you know, our, our sisters and colleagues in, in Mesoamerica through Cosmovision or, and, you know, there's many examples from other parts of the world are telling us is that there's a symbiosis, right? Mm -hmm. We are here as custodians of each other and of the world, um, of nature. Nature is medicine, nature is healing, right? And how do we hold that as part of how we think about leadership and the commons and health? And that, you know, we are all responsible for each other. And I think that COVID as a metaphor, right, has demonstrated that. What happens in Nigeria is going to impact people, in Canada, because the virus right now does not respect borders. Mm -hmm. So the call for universal access to vaccines is another is another articulation of that. Our interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. But like you say, you know, our world is inflamed in terms of the regulation on vaccines, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Our world is inflamed in so many different ways. And I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to, you know, get weird about this. But you know, I think the engine, uh, you know, I spoke about emotions earlier, but I, and I spoke about rage, right? But I think activism at the heart of social change for me, and at the heart of, I think, how it is that I understand feminist leadership, sits a deep love. And it's about love for people and love for the planet, right? And I think if one is not able to hold that in a way that is, is, is about revolutionary love, right? Not, not about romantic love. Um, but, you know, if one is not able to hold that, and by love, I mean, you know, recognizing the human 
Absolutely. Right? And not being a person for what it is that you can get out of them or as a cog in a system of, of, of the reproduction of labor or, or producing or, you know, um, there's something about that recognition across class, race, and gender that I think is something that we also need to recoup. And that does require a certain slowing down. Mm -hmm. And I think why spaces like this to tell stories and, and to connect to different ways of knowing and, and, and relating and learning and sharing become so critical. Absolutely. Absolutely, Shireen. I think, you know, the whole notion of plurality and not, not being linear in terms of common minimum, but looking at the specificity and amplifying it, looking at the difference and acknowledging and respecting that difference. I think that's really well put. I want to go back to a question from Daphne. So she asks how to get involved in the global movement that you're talking about. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. So the global movement is a really big thing, Daphne. <laughs> right. I mean, our world is a big world. Right. And, you know, I think I always say to people who ask, how can I get involved? I always say, start with where you are. Right. Start wow. with where you are. Um, and I think that is the nature of feminist movement building. Wherever it is that we are, there is work to be done. And it's about finding and connecting and or creating the spaces, right? And they do exist. They do exist in, in multiple forms. Um, so that would be my first answer. Start with where you are. There's always work to be done. Um, I think in terms of more global formations, I mean, there are organizations that do work globally. Um, you know, so one of the organizations that I would sort of point you to is perhaps AWOD, right, the Association for Women's Rights in Development, which is a network, right, of organizations that are, that are thinking about these things, right, and, and, and working on these things. Um, you know, jazz likes to think, we like to think of ourselves as a community of practice. So while we have, you know, core staff who support work, in three regions in 27 or 28 countries, I always lose count. Um, you know, um, we also like to think of ourselves as a community of practice for the reason that I said, because in order to shift power, you need the broadest cross section of people, right, to build a counter power. And so, you know, being part of, you know, a, you know, a jazz in, 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 in the sense of that community of practice. And, you know, I'm sure I can share, you know, websites and et cetera, et cetera, if people are interested. So, you know, I think that that's another route that, that one can travel. Um, you know, I think a third route, um, which, which, which is, is also a, a road to travel, definitely depending on where you are and how it is that you are, you are located. Um, and, and I'm saying this because of Cody specifically. Um, I know that Jazz has traveled a long road with Cody through individuals, but I think, you know, we don't read enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is my new thing in Jazz. We don't read enough. <laughs> we don't read enough, you know, and sometimes, you know, just setting up a, a reading group with two or three friends. If you think about organizing in the 60s, right, Black women's organizing in the US specifically, I'm going back to your waves, Sarika. Mm -hmm. Right, what what black women and radical shoot them at Firestone, right? Mm -hmm. That group of people, what it is that they did was they understood the power of sitting around a kitchen table and telling yes. a story. Yes. And using those stories as the material for doing an analysis, a power analysis. Yes. An sectional power analysis. And that can seem like quite a benign thing. But there is huge power. It's my grandmother, right? So when my grandmother used to sit on her veranda, friends used to come and they would have tea and she would bake every day. So there would always be some sweet treat to be She was known for her baking. Mm -hmm. And they would sit on the veranda and they would have tea and eat their cake. And they would tell stories about their lives. And those stories, Embedded in those stories was an analysis of patriarchy. Yes. 
and they supported each other. Oh, so my husband is doing this and this and this. Maybe you should do this and this and this. And that seems benign. That is radical feminism. They may not have been able to use that language, but that is about resistance. And I think we've got to develop the eye to recognize resistance, not by some theoretical standard or by some lexicon that is external to ourselves. Mm-hmm. We've got to be able to recognize the resistance in the day to day because resistance can be tiny, tiny little things that are seemingly, if you look at them through certain eyes, Oh, she refused to cook today. Oh, she didn't leave her husband. Mm -mm. The fact that she didn't cook that supper is a form of resistance. And it's a resistance that is undertaken in the face of potential violence. Because if I don't cook that meal, and that meal is not on the table when my husband comes home, if you're living in the master's house. It's going to have repercussions. Exactly. So a simple thing like inviting friends over, Let's have tea. I'm a big believer of food as part of communal experience and sharing. Come over for tea. Come over for, okay, maybe not now because of COVID. Let's have a Zoom call. Everybody bring their tea. But it's something, some snack. And we're going to read Audre Lord's The Master's House. We're going to read, you know, um, uh, Titi Dangaremba's Nervous Conditions. We're going to read, and then we're going to talk about it. And it doesn't have to be, entire book it could be a page and then we're going to reflect on it through our experience and so not only are you creating community not only are you creating the conditions to begin to start thinking about the person is political not only are you creating a context you're creating a space that is your space it's not an invited space that you've got to navigate you can create it in the way that you want it's a safe space it's the conditions for creating that transformative power, right? We can be, show up as who we are. That trust and laughter that I spoke about, it's that, we friends, we hanging out. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna take two hours. And that is also a radical act because as people who are gendered women, and you all know this, we don't take time for ourselves. So we're running at 60 miles an hour or 120 kilometers an hour for <laughs> kilometers, right? And we never take time for ourselves. And that is about, and, for, and sometimes it's hard, I know that. But I think how we think about in the day to day, creating, even if it's small, even if it's two minutes, even if it's five minutes, is an act of resistance. It's an act of transgression against a system that is saying, you do not deserve time. Your health doesn't count. Wow, 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 wow. So Daphna, there's some ideas for you. Yes, and if, if you can't change the seating arrangement, and if you're not invited to the table, get your folding chair at least. Exactly. So no amount of resistance is small or big. Thank you for saying that. And you know, in, amongst these lived realities, you know, what you're saying essentially, Shireen, is that the analysis has to begin from our bodies. That's a lived reality. And our bodies are highly political sites. They are not just, you know, somebody there, you know. Exactly. They're raced, they're gendered, you know, whether non-binary or queer or women, whichever, or men, you know, whichever. Right, and social networks are very important, which women do not have, you know, our friends, a uh, husband's friend's wife is, you know, willy-nilly our friend because these are the kind of people we hang around with. So who is my friend? And these social networks give, give us that space and which is the space that we are trying, trying to create through this forum. That's very, very beautifully said. I, I don't have questions right now. Uh, maybe when I go down, there are lots of messages, but I, I want to sound you out on some of my sisters who have been talking, you know, about their own experiences. So there is Cyprine Omolo and, and, you know, prior apologies if I don't get your name right. She has a start, she is from an organization called Clean Start Kenya. And she, she says, I'll just quote unquote and read out what she says. We're building a movement of formerly imprisoned women called Coalition of Formerly Imprisoned Women Africa. 
to advocate for systemic within the criminal justice system in Kenya that contributes to the well-being of their children. And then, they, then she says there's so much stigmatization around women's incarceration and getting back our voices. We're trying to ensure that we empower women to be leading voices in advocating for changes in the criminal justice system. And she also says that this is very informative and she's getting great ideas on how she can grow the movement in, across Africa. That's one. Then there is uh, Gayukonda Ortega Alari. Uh, she says, amazing. I'm a woman born and raised in Central America. You've unpacked the issue so well, a feminist that resonates with me at last. Right? Then let me get to the newer questions. Then there's Rehama Fidelis who thanks you, Shireen, and says that this is a great presentation. There's Tabeth Nadoro who say, talks about powerful messages. Thank you so much. Uh, and yes, so yeah, yeah. A lot of people have been talking about how powerful this presentation is. Wow. Thank you. Um, I'm humbled. And um, yeah, I mean, thank you. Thank you for the for the feedback and Sarika for for kind of being the, the voice of, you know, the conversation that's happened in the chat. Um, it's often hard on Zoom when you talking and thinking to kind of track how, how it's being received. So so I really appreciate that. Maybe just a couple things um, in the specificities um, of some of the comments. So um, my sister from Kenya, um, maybe just to say, and you may know this already, I mean, you know, I and we have done some accompaniment work in, in, in Kenya and still, still are doing that, but there's a number of groups that you may find interesting to connect with that you may already know. Um, you know, there's a, there's a very interesting group that is actually based in Zimbabwe called Femprist, and they are doing a lot of work with women in prisons. Um, and I can certainly put you in touch via Sarika um, with, with the woman who is leading that. And there may be some interesting interconnections um, for you to explore with her. I think the other group, the other two groups that I that that I know are doing really good work and can potentially um, you know, um, be in conversation or in solidarity, right, with the work that you are doing um, is um, the World March of Women. Um, who has a very active branch um, in, in Kenya, I know, um, and um, also UAF Africa, um, who do a lot of work around safety and security um, for women on the continent. And so that may be, that may be helpful. Um, to the colleague who, who is from, um, I think it was Central America or, or Latin America. Um, yeah, you know, you know, one of the things I learned so much from 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 that region, and you know, we we have teams and staff and movements that we accompany in in that region, which is very rich in terms of social movement work historically, um, and you know, the interconnect the interconnectedness and the learning that we can do between regions, I, I think, is critical. So, if you take Central America and and, and the African continent to loop back to something that was asked a little earlier around the development industry and, and you know, the decimation of movements. I think that what is interesting in, in terms of a learning across those two geographical spaces is that you know, when struggles for liberation on, in some countries on the African continent then delivered freedom and meant that mm -hmm. liberation movements occupied positions of power with informal state structures. Yes. Right, very, very specific things that were done, because I think in the consolidation of power, the dismantling of community based formations was critical, because many countries on the African continent had very rich movements. It yes. was the yes, they did. liberation, right, from colonial powers. Um, but I think there were moments when the consolidation of, of a liberation movement into a government or state structure meant that part of the early phases of independence was about the deconstruction and the dismantling of community formations. And I think there's, some, there's something to learn from you know, Central America and, and Latin America in terms of how it is that movements have continued to be catalyzed right, as a counterpower and an accountability to, to, to the state. Um, I, I think the last thing that I wanna say about that 
just because you raised that region is, you know, uh, uh, more recently I've been engaging with the work of San Sandra Moran, who's from Guatemala. Um, she, she's a queer feminist activist who was a congressional delegate in, in Guatemala. And, you know, th there's something that she, that she said, which, which lives with me in this period in a way that is very, very alive. Um, you know, she said um, that there are, there, are, there are lots of areas of dispute in our world. And if we do not struggle, if we do not const if we do not struggle as part of resolving these disputes, then we will not be making decisions. Uh, decisions will be made against the common good. Um, and you know, she says that you know the struggles that we are waging are about a confrontation of power. It's about what it means when our power, right? Our collective power confronts their power, right? And what it means to hold collective power against individual power, because that's partly what this is about, right? I mean, you've, we've got Jeff, Jeff, we've got Bezos and um, the guy whose name I, uh, Branson going out into space, right? Um, and yet we've got millions and millions of people who don't have access to basic needs. So it's individuals versus the collective, right? Um, and that the power that we are activating is a power that wants to build, and we are holding that against a power that wants to destroy. And that's the dispute, right? Individual versus collective, common good versus individual interests. Um, and a power that wants to build and hold the earth in a particular way versus a power that wants to extract and destroy it. And she argues that there are actually seven territories that are in dispute in this moment. So seven, seven areas that are under contestation. And the reason why this is so potent for me is because it, it's, it, it speaks to what it is that we need to be thinking about in terms of movement strategy. And the seven territories that she names are the body. So the body is a territory that is under dispute. And we see that anti-gender ideology, you know, you know, the, the way that, that queer people are being vilified, politic, uh, bodily autonomy, the body is one of the seven territories. Land is one of the seven territories. And we see that in terms of extractivism, nature, is the third territory that is under dispute. Now, this is going to surprise you. Memory wow. is the fourth area yeah. that's under dispute. How do we remember? Because if we are written out of the past, then how do we show up in the present? And if we are not seen in the present or accounted for in the present, what does that mean for the future? Yes. I think that's part of what is baked into the movement for Black lives right now, right? Memory, how do we remember? And that's about stories. So memory is the fourth territory history, which is linked to memory is the fifth territory. Worldview is the sixth territory that is under dispute. And the state is the seventh territory that is under dispute. So we have a lot to do, people. Yes, very, very true, indeed. Oh my gosh. And I was wondering if language featured anywhere. I think language language would, for me, would certainly link to worldview, history, and memory. Mm -hmm. um, I have two more questions. And uh, I know we're kind of uh, going a little overboard, but I don't want to leave them. So there is Sayyid Hakim Shah Hashimi who says, uh, Shireen, in most third world countries, women alongside men contribute to gender-based violence. What are your thoughts and what needs to be done in order to eradicate gender-based violence more effectively? That's the first one. Then there's Cecilia who writes something which I also resound in my voice in. She says, uh, thank you very much about this empowering presentation. I would like to learn more about different approaches to feminism. Can you please recommend some readings? So maybe if you mail them across, we'll make sure that, that you know, these reach uh, our participants here. 
and there's uh, there's another person called Pumla Mubizela who also wants to have some of your reading uh, material. I know you've given one already. So uh, I think we'll start with Sayed Hakim's question. Right, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you for the question. Um, absolutely. You know, I always say just because you're in the body of a woman doesn't mean that your politics are progressive. Yes. Because we all live in the master's house, right? And so both women and men in different ways, you know, do um, um, sometimes contribute to or are perpetrators of violence. And it's about the system. I, I think for me in, in, in answering your question, it is about the system. Mm -hmm. How do we change the system to ensure that we are living in a world where all people can be free from violence? In the interim, however, <laughs> right, the work is really the work of consciousness raising. And that's long-term work. It can't be work that is set against, you know, um, set against frameworks or boxes. Right? It's long-term work. How do we ensure that men understand the kind of power and privilege that they hold? And there's two things that I want to say about this because they, they, um, there's a lot of debate around these two things. The first thing is there's a consciousness right now, I think, but there are, there's also a rise in violence as people feel that power may be morphing or changing or slipping away from them. You're seeing a rise in violence against women, misogyny, femicide. And I think that there are a range of organizations and institutions that are engaged in all kinds of work on, on this particular issue, including organizations that are focusing on men and consciousness raising. Um, and that's really, really important. I think though that it starts here also. It's about how it is that we raise our sons and our daughters, how it is that we think about how we relate to people in the world. So there's a level of work that also starts here, even in as much as it's, it's happening in, in the organization. And I think, you know, I spoke about unlikely allies. Um, you know, in jazz, in our, in, in our movement, work, we support a movement of, of HIV positive women that's 8,000 strong in, in, in Malawi, and it's largely rural HIV positive women. And we formed an unlikely alliance with traditional religious leaders. And so many people would ask us, but you are a feminist movement support organization. Why are you forming this partnership that has lasted almost eight, nine, 10 years with a group of progressive religious leaders? And it's about power. It's about understanding that liberation theology is the crack where the light shines through. It's about understanding that if we can get priests and imams to use the pulpit and the member to speak about progressive messaging that ends stigma and discrimination, that ensures treatment and access to testing as well as ARVs for women at community level, that means something. But that takes work. So, you know, when I was traveling prior to this COVID time, I, there was a joke in jazz because every time I went to Malawi, I knew that I would have to sit through a three hour church service. Mm -hmm. And I did. Because it's in the day to day negotiation with the priests and the imams that you make something new. And so, you know, four years in, we ended up in a place where we could have a conversation. So, you know, there are women priests and pastors and there's a women Kiriat group. Um, why can't we have them run the service? Right? And, and the men kind of, and so we would joke and we would fight and, but it's in that, right? It's in that messiness that we remake the new. The last thing that I want to say in terms of the violence question in the interest of time is this, community, this movement that I spoke about, Amadiba, the Amadiba Crisis Committee, they have a rule as part of movement membership. And this is an example of how it is that movements model something different. It's a rural community. Mm -hmm. It spans, I think, three or four villages over a 22 kilometer stretch. And the, one of the rules that they have, one of the principles that they have 
as Amadiba is if anybody commits an act of violence within that community, they are brought to the village council. Mm -hmm. So violence against women is addressed not as an individual responsibility, but as a collective responsibility. Yes. And that's and that, where personal becomes political. Exactly. That is the difference. And that's happening. So that gives us hope. In terms of the readings, I will certainly identify some and I will share with you, Sarika, so that you can share with your colleagues and friends as part of, yeah. Yay. People must read. <laughs> yes, exactly what you said. <laughs> We've got it. <laughs> You know, and, and you know, just, just going back to what Shireen started with about binaries and patriarchy, how it reinforces binaries, is this notion about men versus women and women being born feminist, which doesn't happen. And, you know, a lot of people have written about it, whether you talk about it in terms of false consciousness or in terms of ideological hegemony. If people understood, there would not be this kind of inequality that we see in the world today because we do not understand. And that's also why she's saying we must read. But you know, what, what you're saying takes me back to bell hooks. And mm -hmm. she says, sometimes people try to destroy you precisely because they recognize your power. Not because they don't see it, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist. And I think what you are responding to that, Shireen, is saying that we are seeds. So you know, when you, you, when you put us below earth, we're going to spring back stronger. And what a beautiful, beautiful message it is. And I'm, I'm going to carry it for my life. You know, thank you so much, Shireen. Mm -hmm. I want to call Eileen. And, 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 and you know, I'm, I'm just saying my temporary thank you. I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I want to call upon Kai, Eileen, who heads and is the leader of the Women's Center for Leadership. And uh, to thank us all. And... Uh, you know, let this beautiful evening remain the way it is. Over to you, Eileen. Well, thank you so much, Sarika. Thank you for, for really leading this conversation in such a beautiful way again, again today. And Shireen, um, what an absolute pleasure, pleasure it is to have you here with us today. Um, a, another wonderful conversation. You're, you're the second in the series. You follow the the um, incomparable Srilatha Bhatlawala, of course, um, and uh, and you have not disappointed. You have just, you've also, you know, really elevated the conversation, and it's a really important one for all of us. I know there's several people that were not able to join us today that will be watching the recording, and uh, I'm sure they will have also some reactions to what you've said, and we'll make sure that we share that on to you. Um, you, you mentioned it, and I just want to reiterate, um, you know, I've personally known uh, of the work of jazz, of jazz for quite a long time, both in my, my previous career um, work as well as here at Cody. And when I first arrived in Cody Institute in 2013, and the Women's Center was really new, I had such good fortune to get to know Valerie Miller very quickly. And to, I mean, learn from the best as I was taking on this new role and thinking about what the center could do within the Cody space. And Valerie and others on your team, uh, Melina DeMontes, I believe, and um, the relationships, Lisa Vanaklaas, and of course, your predecessor, um, you know, we, are, we resonate so much with the work of jazz. And, you know, we use the work of jazz in our, in our programming like our Global Change Leaders Program and, and the work uh, of Valerie in particular and Lisa around um, form spaces and levels of power along with John Gaventa, our, our previous uh, vice president and director. This is work that stands the test of time. I've yet to see better work come really forward and in fact challenge us all to keep thinking about how it, how it is framed and reframed and, and brought to bear you know, 10 years on. And so I really want to do share my appreciation to you uh, as you're continuing that work and hopefully looking at ways that we can continue to build those synergies and partnerships. You mentioned Sandra Moore and we had a beautiful opportunity of having Sandra visit the Cody and actually give a talk 
for one of our programs on campus. And what an amazing, amazing individual. Um, and I'm so pleased that, um, to have that reference to her and, and, the, and the work and those, say, those seven territories. So just to end by saying thank you so much and to let everybody else know that's on the call that this is one of a series. Our next uh, next event will be with um, featuring a wonderful Guatemalan activist and scholar and practitioner, Alejandra Colom. And she will come and speak with us in September on the 22nd. And we're going to continue this um, because we think these conversations are important. We might not be around the kitchen table with our books open, which I would love to be doing, um, but we're around, you know, we're in a space here too, and and having these questions and and conversations that are that are challenging for some and uh, and moving forward. So thank you again, and as, you know, especially thank you also to Sarika for leading this. Thank you, thank you, everyone, and have a great evening and a great day. And uh, we remember Moses Cody again today. Remember his values and what he stood for. So bye, everyone. Thank you, Shireen. Bye, everyone.